Welcome to One on One with Expert Flyer. I'm your host, Lisa Kaslin. And you may have read some reports recently about airlines like Lufthansa and United taking action against passengers as well as businesses that are taking advantage of a secret cost-saving tactic known as hidden city ticketing. To help us unravel what this is and whether or not we should take advantage of it, We've invited Bill McGee to join us today. Bill is the author of the airline industry expose, Attention All Passengers. He's also a former airline operations manager, a veteran aviation journalist, and passenger rights advocate. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Pleasure, pleasure to have you. So let's start with a summary of what, what is this hidden city ticketing business? Sure. Well, it's uh, it's one of the uh, very many arcane practices that the airline industry uses. Uh, let me be very clear. I think it's unfair. I don't think mm-hmm. it should be allowed. But unfortunately, it is allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason is, is that it's part of what the airlines call their contracts of carriage. And those mm-hmm. are the the one-sided binding agreements that we may not realize it, but every time we swipe a credit card and book an airline ticket, We're agreeing to, in some cases, up to 90 pages or more than 100 pages of legalese that even lawyers that I've consulted with don't always understand. Um, That's why they're called contracts of adhesion. They're basically one-sided. You know, I mean, you wouldn't buy a house and say, you know, well, you write the contract and I'll just sign it, right? You know, Mm -hmm, you wouldn't do that mm -hmm. with anything in life. But that's what you do every time you buy an airline ticket. And so these rules are embedded in there. And unfortunately, Congress has not done anything about it. The Department of Transportation has not done anything about it. The courts have not done anything about it. So I can't stress it enough. These are practices you don't want to engage in. Okay. Um, so Hidden City often goes hand in hand with something called uh, back-to-back uh, ticketing. But both of them, what they mean is um, it, it has to do with the fact that you see a low fare online. Mm-hmm. Say you want to go from uh, New York to Chicago Mm -hmm. and uh, you see that the fare, I'm going to make the numbers really simple. The fare is $500 from New York to Chicago. But if you fly from New York to Chicago and you go on from Chicago to Milwaukee, you see that there's a $250 fare. So you think, well, I'll go to Chicago to the hub. And then instead of going on to Milwaukee, I'll just tear up that part of the ticket and I'll get off in Chicago and go to my meeting or whatever it is I'm doing and I'll come home. Why not? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> don't even think about trying it. I can't stress it oh. enough because um, all you have to do is go into uh, one of the major airlines contracts. For example, I just took a look at United's contract. And, you know, if you do a word search, it's, it's you know, like I said, it's about 90 pages long. But if you do a word search on uh, Hidden City you'll see that the the penalties are absolutely draconian okay um up to and including this is not this is not i'm not making this up up to and including banning you for life from the airline they can uh you know uh, add you know credit to your credit card that's on file um they can take away your freaking fire miles they can strand you in the middle of your trip okay um, you better not have checked baggage on board because you may not get it back. I mean, it really, it's incredible how anti-consumer it is. I've been speaking out about it for years. Many others have too. But again, um, you know, absent any kind of action from the government or from the courts to say that this is unfair, uh, you know, the airlines basically say, you agreed to it. Um, of course, nobody agrees to this, but yet we do every time, like I say, every time you swipe your credit card. Yeah, you well, it's all of this fine print. Yeah, it, it's interesting because uh, last week NPR uh, reported on uh, Lufthansa and, and their suing of a passenger who was flying from, I guess, Oslo to Seattle, but right. they didn't actually go to Seattle. They yeah. they got off in Frankfurt, yeah. and the fare, I think, was uh, something around 740 bucks, right? And yeah. the airline was saying, well, hey that actually should have cost over three thousand dollars i guess it was a business right. class seat and they yeah. should have, but it was uh the the uh the consumer actually actually won the case the case was dismissed so i mean i don't know is that an indication that um there's hope um i wish i could say yes because nobody wants to be more more optimistic about it than <laughs> I. Uh, but i have to tell you 
Um, I think the, 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 the caveat here is that it was Lufthansa. Uh-huh. Um, for example, you know, the, the contracts that I was just talking about, these contracts, I was referring to U.S. airlines. Uh, yes. um, in the European Union, uh, since about 2006, for many years now, there's actually been uh, a passenger bill of rights. There, there are rights for travelers when you're traveling in Europe, including U.S. travelers, Americans. Um, so, for example... Uh, about uh, six years ago, I was in Belgium and I got on a flight and uh, uh, it was out of Brussels and we taxied out and I was one of the people that noticed there was a problem on the wing. I used to work in airline flight operations and we notified the cockpit and sure enough there was and it required a maintenance uh, delay of about, about four hours and it was textbook. They did everything perfect. I mean, this is what I do for a living, so I, I was mm-hmm. closely monitoring it. They gave us, you know, vouchers for meals in the airport. They kept us updated constantly. They were terrific. Uh, the, the kicker to this story is that it was Delta Airlines, and I bash Delta all the time, but I bash them in the U.S. The reason that Delta did everything perfectly in this case was because they were required to by law in the EU. If hmm. that exact same delay wow. with the same crew and the same aircraft had happened in Delta's headquarters and, and, and hub in Atlanta, I doubt that we would have been treated as well because there's no requirement in U.S. law. So that's why, you know, in my book, Attention All Passengers, I strongly advocated for a passenger bill of rights, similar to what they have in the U- EU. Um, so I really don't see, I'm glad in this case, the Lufthansa passenger was compensated and, and you know, kudos for that. Mm-hmm. But I really don't see anything changing in the U.S. until... We, we are able to, you know, get our own passenger bill of rights here. Well, okay. Yeah, and I, I also uh, noticed that there, there's, a, there's a company called Skip Lagged. Have you heard about them? Yeah. Have, yes, yes, I've been on the site. And again, you know, I mean, I, you know, as, as a journalist myself, sometimes I'll read an article and I'll say, hey, think about doing this, you know. Uh-huh. And I get winced because, you know, uh, when you reached out to me on this, I think I put it in all caps, you know. <laughs> Please don't advise anyone to do this. Yes, it's not did. because I'm defending the airlines. It's not because I think they have a right to do it. I don't. I couldn't disagree with them more. Yeah. I'm 180 degrees opposed to you know the airlines' view on this, but you will be penalized. There's no okay. question. Okay. And, well, and the th- thing is, you know, it's so easy for them now. They know exactly what you're doing. The algorithms are built into the computers. They know when you know you fly part of an itinerary I and mean, they know immediately it's not like something that they have to go looking through records about right yeah and so you know it's not even that you could be penalized a month later you could be penalized in chicago and not be able to get home yeah you know yeah. uh it, it's that serious okay uh, all right I, so I wrote that- an editorial about this uh, i dug it out and it i didn't i was surprised how long ago it was it was like uh, you know about 15 years ago and my son was very young and um at the time he was four or five and he uh, he loved McDonald's, but it wasn't for the food. He loved the, the Happy Meals with the toys. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't even eat French fries. It was unusual in that most kids like fries. He doesn't. And we would get a Happy Meal, and he wouldn't eat most of it, but he got his toy. And so I wrote an editorial saying, imagine if the McDonald's manager came over and said, you know, give that toy back. You didn't eat your fries. Um, basically, what the airlines are saying is you have to use every, every leg of the, the journey that you paid for or we're going to penalize you, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's really, it's unthinkable in any other industry. What industry tells you, we're selling you a product, and now we're going to tell you how you can use it, you know? No. Uh, you know, well, you bought that sofa. You need to sit on it twice a, w- twice a week. Otherwise, we're going to take it back. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it, it gets absurd because there's no yeah. other example that you can point to. Yeah, well, the bottom line is that, you know, they can't monetize their 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 load factor probably you know to the best of their ability so that that's what it boils down to it's not about what's good for us or what we want it's (laughs) they're not making as much money as they could so you (laughs) you had you had mentioned um that there there are some other gray area practices uh on the part of the airline and um you had mentioned you know that there's sort of this i guess uh i don't know situation where um, some passengers are treated differently than others when it comes to being bu- bumped due to overbooking, um, as well as when flights are canceled or, or delayed. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Well, 
you know, things changed dramatically. I mean, going back before, you know, most of us were involved in the industry, back in 1978, when the U.S. airline industry was deregulated. And prior to that, the government, you know, oversaw everything, the routes, the fares, they dictated fares, everything. Um, and, you know, obviously deregulation has been a good thing in many ways, but there's been some downsides. And, um, you know, I'm concerned about some of the safety issues. We could talk about that another day. But um, one of the things that I wrote about extensively in Attention All Passengers is the fact that with the with when deregulation ended, um, excuse me, when deregulation started, excuse me, when the regulated era ended, um, we're now at at uh, there are no more government rules in place for how passengers should be treated during what they call irregular operations, extend, extended delays, canceled flights, you know, being bumped, and there used to be rules in place, and so you know the airlines sort of even for years after after um, the industry was deregulated. They still sort of kept some of the rules and then gradually they started dropping them. So to put it in perspective for you, um, as recently as the 1990s, most of the rules were still in place from the night, from 20 years later after deregulation. So if there was a, um, a, a cancel flight, for example, you could go on those contracts of carriage that I referenced and it would say in very plain English, you didn't have to be a lawyer to understand it. If the flight is canceled, you are entitled to the following. And it would say a meal, um, transportation to a hotel, uh, you know, when I'd stay at a hotel, you'd be booked on the next available flight. It would, you know, very specifically, and it would say, you will be, you know, entitled to this. And even to date it, it would say things like you get a phone card, right, which you haven't mm -hmm. seen in a while. Well, now, if you go on those same contracts for U.S. airlines, you'll see that the language is very, very mushy. You know, mm -hmm. I know that's not a legal term, mushy, but that's exactly mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, it'll say things like, well, the the airline may do such and such. Well, of course, in a in a legal binding contract, what does the word "may" mean, right? Mm -hmm. It's like saying I may pay you for the yeah you know, for, right. for mm -hmm. you know that service that you're doing for me. Would you sign that? You know. <laughs> no. So the reason why it, it is most definitely intentional. The reason why is. Um, I talk about it at length in Attention All Passengers. I call it one of the dirty little secrets of the airline industry. The fact is, you know, I think as Americans, we all sort of, you know, inherently believe we're, we're created equal. It's in our DNA. We like to think it even when it, when it doesn't happen, right? But we like to believe in that. Well, the airline industry doesn't even pretend to believe in that. Because basically, um, there are algorithms built in to your booking code. When you have that um, that locator number, when you have a flight and it says, you know, type in that number it looks like a dmv number for you registering your car it has letters and numbers and it yes. doesn't mean anything to the mm -hmm. consumer but you know x a y three five you put that in there are there are codes built in many of them are computerized they're not even understood by humans but they're built in to who you are to the airline and your value is mm -hmm. uh is going to be based on that so in other words and i'm talking about just in in economy class right we mm -hmm. all know that the people in business and in first are much better human beings right. than we are. Of we course. That. We know that they're a the higher class of people. We wouldn't even pretend to be as good as them. But just with an economy, let's yeah. say you're sitting in 25A and I'm sitting next to you in 25B and suddenly it's announced that the flight is canceled and it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night and there's not another flight uh -huh. and, you know, we're not going to be able to get out until the morning. Um, you may be accommodated. And you may be given a hotel and I may be sleeping on a hard plastic chair in the airport based on several factors that are built into those codes. A, how much did you pay? You yeah. may have paid five hundred dollars and I may have paid, you know, two hundred. Mm -hmm. B, what was the uh, methodology? Did you buy directly from the airline or through an outside source, a travel agency, an online travel OTA, agency? Yeah. B exactly. Uh, you know, C uh, what was the channel? Was it on, you know, in person at the counter at the at the airport? Was it, you know, through reservations by phone? Was it, you know, uh, online? Um, airline distribution is something that uh, it gets very, very complex very quickly, mm -hmm. and there is a hierarchy. And so, you know, God help me if I booked on Priceline and got a really, you know, cheap <laughs> fare when something goes wrong. Yeah. Um, the airline's fully aware of it. So the days of saying, well, you know, this flight is canceled and there are 100 inconvenienced passengers and here's what we're going to do for all 100 of you as they used to back when I worked in the airline industry. You know, we'd get on the microphone and say, here's what we're going to do for everyone. Now you notice you don't see those announcements because they're not doing the same thing for everyone. So, 
you know, based on frequent flyer status, all kinds of factors, many of which, you know, we're not even privy to because all of this, don't forget, it's opaque, right? It's behind yeah. this, you know, I call uh -huh. it like, you know, I liken it to the Wizard of Oz, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain over there, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, you know, we don't really know what's going on. And, um, you know, with that infamous incident that happened on United Airlines uh, two years ago with Dr. David Dow when he was dragged mm -hmm. off a flight, um, I testified in Congress at a hearing uh, shortly after that to discuss these issues. And that's another thing, bumping. You know, there were tons and tons and tons of stories written about that. But one question was never answered, even at the, at the congressional hearing when I raised it, is it's a very simple question. Why him? It was a full yeah. flight. Yeah. Why Dr. Dow? It's yeah. a question that United never answered. The industry has never answered. Even, like I say, we had a four and a half hour congressional hearing. It wasn't answered. Isn't it a fair and logical question? If there's a hundred people on board, why did they take this guy and physically drag him off to the point where he had a concussion and a bloody nose? You know, why? Um, what was it about him? Uh, and so, you know, you go online and you'll see all kinds of theories. Some of them may seem more far-fetched than others, but quite frankly, there's an information vacuum, right? There's, they're not sharing what that is. So, you know, there are all kinds of theories about why him. But until the airlines explain those algorithms to us, how are we to know? Um, and so, you know, I think this is, this, as I say, in attention all passengers, that's how I describe it. The airline industry's dirty little secret is, you know, they say that we're all, you know, important to them. But some of us are much more important than others, you know. And um, so the, the, the key for consumers is yes. that contract of carriage is to, is to be familiar with it, use their language and throw it back at them, you know, as much as you can. You know, when you're asking for accommodations, when there's been a delayed flight or canceled or bumped, you know, use uh -huh. those things. Say, well, I was looking at the contract of carriage. They're all online. You can easily, uh -huh. you know, they're lengthy. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But you can do a word search and say, well, you know, in your contract of carriage, you say you may do such and such. Could you please, you know, give me a meal voucher? Uh -huh. you, you know, chances are you're going to do better than the person that just says, you know, What's yeah, going on? takes I takes what they you. takes what they get. Yeah, exactly. Wow. But uh, it really is the wild west as far as passenger rights. Uh, okay, there are very few very few rights for for passengers in the United States. Well, will there ever be a bill of rights for passengers? Because I mean, as we were talking before the the interview started, there are so many uh, advocacy groups out there, and I, I it's not the first time that you know I've I've you know had this discussion, but it, it just seems like. It, it just never happens. This and, right. and it's kind of, it's it's almost absurd that it would be difficult to get yeah. a you know a passenger's bill of rights. I, I agree, and I've you know I've been fighting for it for years myself. I advocated it, attention all passengers. Um, as who's I saying say, no? Really, who's saying no to it? Who's uh, saying, who's no? saying no? Is well, Congress and the Department of Transportation. So whether you look at it as a legislative issue through Congress or a regulatory issue through the Department of Transportation. And, you know, I'll, I'll be very clear about this. It is a bipartisan thing. In other words, you know, this could have happened uh, under four different administrations, you know, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican. Um, it's not as if one party is for it and one is against it. Mm -hmm. um, but look, let's, let's be blunt. Um, the fact is, this is an industry that has a huge, huge lobbying presence in Washington, mm -hmm. um, you know, both for presidential candidates and, you know, in Congress. As I say, mm -hmm. both parties, House, Senate, um, we've seen some, you know, minor improvements around the edges over the years, and some of us have lobbied for them. Uh, but the fact is, you know, the EU did what we, I think we should do, mm -hmm. which is just put into place very simple document. The thing is, you know, not only do you not have to be a lawyer to understand the EU rules, anyone can understand. Them. They're on posters. They're, they're very mm -hmm. brief. It says, if there's a delayed flight, like I was telling you about in Brussels mm -hmm. with my Delta flight, this is what you're entitled to. Not what you may get, not what you can get, what you will get. If the flight is canceled, if your you know baggage is, is lost or damaged, um, if you get bumped against your will, again, it's all spelled out. The European Airlines screamed, you know, a decade ago, you're going to put us out of business. It didn't, you know. In fact, it makes them more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada is now, I'm happy to say, Canada is now considering something. They're asking for public comments. Uh, I just weighed in myself on that. You know, it's happening in other countries. Hopefully, it'll happen here. But, you know, we have to be realistic. There is a very powerful airline lobby. 
And um, the airline industry has a history of only seeing positive improvement after bad things happen. Mm-hmm, I'm just being mm-hmm. blunt about that. Mm-hmm. Whether it's on the safety side or whether it's something like Dr. Dow, you know. That Dr. Dow event happened. It became a media event. Everybody in the country was talking about it. Yeah. And two weeks later, there was a hearing in Congress. You know. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know. It was-